We start a new series today. Sorry, I'm still a little bit croaky uh, here right now, but uh, the Lord's going to give me strength. I know that. I guess I've preached a couple of thousand times here, so you might expect uh, a few messages from time to time where I'm, the pastor's a little croaky. I, I guess um, that happens to you as well from time to time. The only thing is you don't have to preach and let everyone listen to that. So, uh, but I believe we're going to have a good time in the house of the Lord. Amen. So our new series is called Who I Am. I'm going to explain that to you, and the title this morning on this specific message is This Is It from Romans 5, verse 1, uh, and almost to, to uh, verse 11. So let's read on, therefore is the first word, which clearly tells us that something has gone on before that. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also, now this is a phrase that's like fresh information for us from the book of Romans, but we also glory in our sufferings. The theme of suffering gets introduced here, and usually we treat suffering as a very unwelcome guest in our life. And no one wants to invite suffering into our life. That would be a strange thing to do. But notice that Paul says we Put your seatbelts on for this one. Glory in our sufferings. Clearly, that's a different perspective that we're going to learn. We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love, I love this phrase, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. And now Paul takes us backwards. He takes us just to re- not lose our perspective here. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation and, I, and all God's people said to the reading of his word, amen. Let me have a good look at you all this morning through the fog and the mist here that seems to have come down strangely. I don't know if it's the Shekinah glory of the Lord or whether it's a smoke machine, but give me a wave if you're all there. I'd just like to be able to see you. I can see some people over there. That's awesome to know we've got some people in the house here today. Uh, allow me to introduce our series and then dive into our reading. One of the helpful buzzwords amongst Christian people in the last decade has been the word identity. Uh, To know our identity in Christ settles so much. It's vital that we know who we are. The world has, as you know, tried, and I don't want to belabor this point, but the world has tried to distort and twist and confuse and redefine human identity. How's that working out for us? I don't believe it's compassionate at all to affirm the devil's delusions. We need the truth to set us free. The alive in Christ, Bible-believing Christian is not blown about by every wind or doctrine or fad. We are settled and solid because we know who Jesus is. We know that he's all we need, and he is our identity. And so Romans 5 is filled with that. We have the Holy Spirit. We are in Christ. Uh, Chris Tomlin made the song famous, You're a Good, Good Father. It was actually written by someone who lives in our community called Pat Barrett. Uh, But uh, you may well know the song, you're a good, good father, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am. When I understand who God is, and when I'm rightly related to God, that defines my identity. If you're a follower of Jesus, 
That must be your prime identity. If you put another adjective to describe what kind of Christian you are, let me tell you that adjective is probably your prime identity. We're going to lose all the other adjectives, and I remind us that the only kind of Christian is someone with Christ in us. There is no other kind of Christian but those who follow Christ. Verse 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts. That's who we are, and that's who I am. Someone's going to give God praise in a moment, and I'll even start preaching if you would encourage me along the way. He's a good, good father, and those who believe are his adopted and loved children. When we understand our identity in relationship to Jesus, that settles everything. And so as we travel through Romans 5 and Romans 6 and Romans 7, as we go through the struggle even of being in Christ and yet still from time to time sinning, we'll eventually get to Romans chapter 8. We're not going to helicopter into Romans 8, though we love the high points of the Christian faith. We're going to climb up Romans 5, 6, and 7, and when we get to Romans 8, it's going to be all the sweeter as well. Amen. We've got an entire series called The Great Eight coming up as we get there. So let's just dive into the passage. Verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, notice the emphasis, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's something that's received personally, but also experienced collectively as well. And that's why we need to gather as God's people. Some people say, well, I don't need to go to church. I am the church. I heard a preacher say even this week, well, Jesus didn't say, we don't need to go to the temple. I am the temple. And he actually was. Jesus didn't say, I am the synagogue. Jesus also went to the synagogue. And so well done for gathering as the Lord's people on this low Sunday to say, this is who I am. This is who we are. Uh, Let me give a quick summary of how we got here, just in case you missed it all the last few weeks. Romans 1 to 3 shows the need for justification. Everyone say need. And that was the whole thing about being guilty before God in chapter 1 and 3. Romans 4 shows the way of justification. God has been faithful to his promises. Abraham was a man of faith, and we need faith in Jesus. And now Romans 5 shows the benefits of justification. Would you like to know the good things that God has given to you? Well, it's important for us to know who we are and to stand in that. Chapter 5 tells us what it's like when our feet have been lifted out of the miry clay and our feet placed upon a rock. It's almost like the Apostle Paul is saying, look everybody, this is it. Now you are in Christ. Let's experience all that we are as a follower of Jesus. So this is another good news passage. And very simply this morning, what I'd love us to do is to focus on first what God has done, and secondly, what God is doing. What God has done, and then what God is doing. I reckon we can handle that today. Here's the first thing, and let me just stretch that out a little bit. My first point, and main point is, what God has done for who I am. Let's focus on what God has done for who I am. In other words, that phrase, who I am, reminds us everything that God has done in order to make me a follower of Jesus Christ. And these words are going to encourage you. First of all, we've been justified. Everyone say justified. Because of the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, we can look back and say, I was justified. It is finished. It's been done. You cannot take that away. The way to be justified is to believe in Christ. If you believe in Christ, my friends, then you are justified. Justified means to declare someone as righteous in God's sight, not by merit, but by the grace of Jesus Christ. So instead of guilty, as chapter 1 to 3 told us we are, instead of guilty, it is no longer guilty or not guilty. I tell you, it's even better than that. Because if in this world someone gets pronounced as not guilty, we might still say that a cloud hangs over them. Even though that shouldn't be the case, someone is declared not guilty. It's like, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll reserve judgment on that one. But God's verdict of you and I is that we were guilty. We are now not guilty. In actual fact, we are justified. What does justified mean? Well, we've already explained it, but I love the, the old preacher that once explained justification. It's just if I'd never sinned. Isn't that a beautiful way of expressing it? It's just if I'd never sinned. I was guilty. Now I'm not guilty. Now I've been justified. And so there is no cloud hanging over any Christian today. Maybe you come here into God's house today and you're feeling shame about all the stuff that you've done and all the problems that you've had. Well, we understand that. We're all in the same boat. But you know something? The, the, the way is level at the foot of the cross. We come before the Lord Jesus today and that cloud has been lifted. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God's verdict on the Christian today is this one is justified. And we can declare along with the Apostle Paul, we have been 
justified. Let's give God praise for that wonderful, no longer guilty, no, no condemnation. And then there is peace. Isn't that a great word? That's where we left off last Easter Sunday. Jesus walked into the room after all they'd been through, after all the failures and the denials and the runnings away. Jesus walks into that room where those 10 disciples were. Judas is uh, betrayed. Thomas didn't show up till the next week. He kind of missed the crucial session. Isn't that, isn't that great the way it goes? Sometimes God shows up in a supernatural way. There's always Thomas, and you have to kind of a, the family group leader has to give him a call. How are you doing, Thomas? I haven't seen you in church for a few weeks. But it's like, praise God, Jesus walks in and says, peace be with you. He said it on the first Easter Sunday, and next time when Thomas is there, Jesus also repeats himself and says, peace be with you. Justified. Peace. Our feet are on the rock. Justified. Peace. Thirdly, access. Verse 2. Have you ever experienced password not recognized? If that, that Username not recognized. And you're going through the whole system. Nothing is recognized. You've gone through it again and again. Nothing recognized. We don't even know who you are. Computer says no. You may be the most patient person on the earth, but you spend 45 minutes in that death loop of a call center. That's what I call it anyway. And you'll know that access denied, we don't even know who you are, can be very, very frustrating. Give me a wave. Am I the only one that's ever been challenged on my sanctification over that one? And then you go on vacation. Oh, pastor, I've been working so hard. We can't wait to get away. We're going to have a great vacation. So you pile the whole family uh, in, in, your, in your car, and you, you, you travel down with three million people down to Florida, or, or you, you head out east uh, with another three million people, and you finally get there, and you're exhausted, and you're about to go into your Verbo property or your Airbnb, and uh, you, you, you tap in the, the PIN number, and it's like, access denied. You know how that feels, and then you phone up the owners and say, I can't get in. They say, uh, yeah, we've been having a lot of trouble with the keypad. It's like, well, thank you very much for solving that problem. Give me a wave if you know what I'm talking about. Am I the only one as well? And so, or you're trying to go through the x-ray machine at the airport, and access is denied, and it keeps beeping, and they're looking at you. Really funny at that point. You've taken off everything you can conceivably and legally take off at that point. You still can't get through. Is there something? Is there some tissue in your pocket, sir? And you just can't through. Access denied. Can I tell you, my friends, when it comes to the work of Christ, we were guilty. Access was denied denied, but because of Jesus, we are justified, we have peace, and we have access. How good is our God? How great is our God? The curtain is torn in two. We have access. The invitation is given and accepted. Do you know what you and I need to do? We need to go and walk on through. We need to say, thank you, Father. Now, Chuck Swindell on this very same verse says, access literally means the process of being ushered into the court of a king and then being announced what they are planning implies the right or opportunity to address the ruler. Isn't that wonderful that we come before God, we can bring our prayer request to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. We have access in prayer. We have access in fellowship. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us from all sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. I thank God that I have access to him. That's nothing to do with my merit. It's everything to do with what Christ did on the cross. Access is in a new territory called grace with the family of God. The new land operates according to an entirely different standard, as the scripture says here, in which we stand. And the Greek of that phrase, in which we stand, literally means the establishment of something permanent. If you don't know our story, uh, we were ministering in the UK when New Hope gave us a call and said, hey, we'd like you to come and meet with us. And in a very short time, suddenly we were called uh, I was called to be the pastor at New Hope, and we were one church in two locations at the time. I think we were the, like the only second, only the, the second um, uh, Baptist church in America to have two campuses. So that was quite a thing uh, coming to you all. And but you, if you know our story, we eventually became permanent citizens. That meant that um, you know when you become a permanent citizen, you get a green card. It means all legal claims against you being here are revoked. Uh, but, but just to make sure we became citizens, just in case that you all knew. And so even though we talk funny, we became citizens. And I just want to say, Christian, you have a permanent residency in the land of grace, even if you all talk funny as well. Let's give God praise that we have been granted access. 
So I think this message is encouraging to us today. After all we've seen Christ do for us at Easter time, we come back on Low Sunday, and it's still true, and it's wonderfully true that we have access to the living God, justification and peace. But then Paul just takes us back one step. Now, the devil will remind you of your sins. Um, your conscience will condemn you of your sins, even though Christ has forgiven you. But occasionally, the Lord sort of reminds us of where we've come from. And so verse 6, we see the Lord graciously say, or Paul say, you see, just at the right time when we were powerless. There we are, standing our feet on the rock. We're encouraged about our identity in Christ. But then we're taken back to consider that it's all because of the cross. But we're taken back to remember that we were powerless. We were stuck. We were unable to move. In the previous service at the South Campus, my son-in-law, Austin, and his dad, Alan, were in the, the congregation. I asked for permission to tell the story because even though these are very practical men, by the way, who has kind of good practical gifts? You kind of like got craftsmanship gifts or you, you're good with your hands or you know how to drive trucks. Like, give, give me a wave. If I'm, I know there's some of you are like this. More than three people. There you go. Uh, well, well, they are those kinds of men. Austin is a pilot. And, and Alan's an engineer, and so they're really, really practical stuff, and I feel like, you know, I, I just feel like I'm completely rubbish when I'm around them, because they just know what to do, and they fix stuff, and we just stand there like, I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, but they're really, really practical. But even these practical guys got themselves into a fix a couple of years ago. Uh, Alan asked Austin to drive his F-150, the old version, F-150 onto this soaking wet grass to try and pull something out. I think he was pulling a tree stump out, and of course, the F-150 got stuck. So Alan came along with his F-150, and he went to sort of a, a, attach it to, to pull out the other F-150. He got stuck as well. And then, then they had to get another superior force to eventually pull them out as well. Actually, the illustration breaks down, because I wish I could say to you that it was like this massive tractor or, or something or other. It was actually a Jeep. Anyway, so they, they got the Jeep. It was his daughter's Jeep, and that, they, that, that got pulled out as well. And I just want to remind us, friends, that that story reminds us of my story, that I was stuck. Without Jesus, I was stuck. I was unable to save myself. And I know we've gone through the book of Romans, and that emphasizes the point, but can I just remind us that we cannot save ourselves? Now, the world says, you don't, I don't need saving. The world says, I don't need nothing. I can do it all myself. Uh, Eventually, there comes a point in life when you realize that you cannot do it on your own, but you need a supernatural power to help you out. And the supernatural power is the cross of Jesus Christ. We praise God for Romans. the rest of that verse, Romans 5, 6. You see, just at the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So our feet are upon the rock. We're rejoicing in access, peace, and justification. But we're reminded it's not through your own strength. It's through the cross of Christ. It's through the blood of Jesus. None of us are powerful of ourselves. The only power we have comes through the wonderful power given to us on the cross of Jesus Christ. And then verse 7 reminds us that Jesus was willing to die for the unrighteous. We didn't deserve that he died for us, but by his amazing grace, he died for me and died for you. I know something about you, my friend. You're the same as me. You've sinned against a holy God. But we thank God for the good news that Jesus forgives us. Verse 8, God demonstrates. Everyone say demonstrates. Well, how do I know God loves me? Well, it's not about your feelings, my friend. We know God loves us by the fact of the cross. He demonstrates his own love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It always does me good to look at the cross it always, always does me good when I just take some time and I read maybe a verse of scripture about Christ on the cross and I reflect on that and it soon starts to move me and remind me of how much I am loved. And then verse 9 to 11 show us that we've been justified, saved, and reconciled. You know, there's a Greek tense called the aorist tense. We just talk about the past tense, but the Greek aorist tense is a more decisive past tense than we have in our English. And essentially, the, the aorist tense means it's a once and for all thing. We've been justified. Uh, Christ has died on the cross. The tenses that are often used in this passage show us that this is a once and for all irreversible fact that Jesus has died for us, and therefore we are justified. It's occurred. We've been saved, and we've been reconciled. Aorist tense, the past has been forgiven. It's all done for us on the cross. And so... What we're seeing so far as we get to this stage in Romans 5, Paul asks us kind of to stop and consider where we are. So the first point has been, 
what God has done for who I am. The cross defines who I am. I was powerless of myself, but through the power of God, I've been lifted up out of that miry clay, my feet placed upon a rock. I have access with God. I can talk to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That is my identity, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. In the time we've got left, I'd like to talk about what God is doing in you and in us, just from verse 3 to verse 5. We've covered most of the passage, but I think it's a really good thing to remind ourselves that everything that God is doing in your life is ultimately through the cross of Christ. We can't accomplish anything unless it's through the cross of Jesus Christ, unless it's through a relationship with God. We enter the king's presence. We're invited to his table. God has done all this. But pastor, if God has done all this, and if this really is my identity, why is life still tough? Why do I still hurt? Why is there so much struggle? Why do Christians suffer? Why do good people go through hard times? Why is marriage a little challenge on one or two days, or maybe a few more? Uh, wh why do I sometimes feel like I'm a terrible parent? I uh, hope it's not because you're a terrible parent. <laughs> but I think there are days when we feel like that. Uh, why do we get sick? And of course, we pray for those who are not well. Why is this world so crazy? Why is this world so scary right now? Why are we hurting? Why hasn't God just put everything right? So we have a lot of questions every day. And you may be comforted to hear me say this in relation to the passage because this is your world. This is your struggle as well. We know who we are in Christ, and yet there are problems and struggles around us. And so Paul introduces for the first time into the book of Romans the theme of suffering. Everyone say, suffering. And here's something that I want to say about these beautiful verses from verse 3 and onwards. Suffering shapes us eventually in a good way. Do you agree with that statement? Suffering shapes us eventually. That tells you something about the battle and the struggle that goes on, and we don't like it, and this suffering feels like an unwelcome stranger into our life. How dare that come into my life. I want a nice, easy, western, affluent, comfortable lifestyle with no problems, right? And isn't God gracious that he doesn't give us what we scream for sometimes? Isn't God gracious that he gives us what we need rather than what we want? And, and so suffering comes in. Suffering shapes us eventually in a good way. And so from verse 3 to 5, we're going to see a kind of chain reaction. You know, there was that song, Chain Reaction, or many of you some of you will probably even know what that song is anyway. So uh, you're, you're way too young for that one. Who sang that one? Was it Diana Ross, was it? I'm in the middle of a chain reaction. Come on, y'all. Come on. So, so that there's, a, there's a kind of spiritual chain reaction. I hope that was a good song, by the way. <laughs> but please, please don't check the lyrics. I'm sure it was very, very nice. I'm sure it was a very, very nice song. Anyway, so this, this is about our growth, it's about maturity, and it's about becoming more like Jesus. So let's look at verse 3 onwards. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And I want to put this on the screen right now to sort of see this chain reaction, almost like the domino effect that takes place. First of all, let's just consider suffering. Uh, would you agree with me that suffering exists? Does suffering exist in your life? Do you have problems? Do you have difficulties? Do you have trials? Of course. So, so none of us is arguing about the presence of suffering in this world. We might be angry and frustrated or whatever, that, that that is in our life right now. But I would just want to encourage you that this is not just like dealing once and for all with the problem of suffering in your life. Can I suggest to you, this is going to be an ongoing reality in your life and in your world before Jesus comes. There is going to be suffering around us. If you're not suffering, somebody else is suffering. If we're insensitive to that suffering, we've lost all sensitivity. So there's got to be some awareness of suffering in our life. So suffering. Uh, so here, here I am, here I'm suffering, I'm struggling, and so um, that's the end of the story. I'm going to complain about it, I'm going to fight against it, I'm just going to pray for my breakthrough. By the way, I'm all for breakthroughs. I've got a breakthrough prayer list. We as a church are experiencing a breakthrough, but you know sometimes you only hear about the breakthrough. How about what God is actually wanting to accomplish in the suffering? 
And this is the teaching of Paul. This is the change of perspective. This is the maturity that Christian people need in this day and age. We move from suffering into perseverance. Just keep this on the screen. Perseverance. Uh, what happens if I give up in my suffering? I'm going to leave the church because things didn't work out the way I wanted to be. I'm going to leave the faith. I'm going to be a former evangelical. I don't even care about the things of God anymore. I'm going to deconstruct because, you know, I want to deconstruct, by the way, usually means because you want to sleep with someone that you shouldn't sleep with. It's usually what it means most of the time. Thank you, sister. And so suffering, so am I just going to kind of, is my faith going to melt away in the midst of suffering? Hey, the, our central picture of what it is to be a Christian is the cross of Jesus Christ. In the middle of our faith is suffering. Amen? And so I'm just going to suffer or not suffer, rail against it, give up, whine. Amen? Or I can persevere. I can persevere. The, that's a, is it a good thing to persevere, my friend? And church, I want to tell you, you have persevered. Bless you. You've come thus far, my friend. From perseverance comes character. Oh, we'd love to be a, he's such a character, we sometimes say. It's like character ultimately comes from persevering through suffering. Does this encourage you, my friend, not to give up through the hard times, but to what? Persevere. That means that we worship. We, we pray. We, f we forgive. We ask to be forgiven. We persevere, and that builds character. And what does character lead to? It leads us to hope. Now, we sometimes want to jump straight from the suffering to hope. In the midst of my suffering, give me hope. Amen. The Lord will give you hope, but he also wants you to persevere. And he also wants to do something in you that's not separate from the cross. It's all through the cross, but he wants to make you and I more like Jesus. That's called sanctification, becoming more holy, becoming more like Christ. And in this character, so there is so much hope because you know what? I've seen what God has done. He's brought me thus far. I remember when I was powerless. I remember when I had nothing. I remember when I, when I was broken. But do you know something? God has given you a testimony, my friend. And it's important for us to testify that even in the midst of those hard times, he made me strong. He didn't make me immune to further suffering. That suffering will come again. It will hit me in the face again. And so we are forewarned and forearmed that when suffering comes, we as a church will persevere and Christ will build our character. And we are a people of hope. Why? We've even got it in our name. We are new hope. Amen? So when the devilish attacks came upon the church of God across the world in one of the biggest challenges of, of um, Christian people in recent history, the rhythms of discipleship in 2020 and 2021 were so attacked and interrupted, can I just thank God for each and every one of you because you persevered. Now, I know that not everyone persevered, but let me tell you, God is so gracious that he will give some of your dear friends the opportunity to persevere again. And to realize, wow, well, if only I had persevered, well, Lord, thank you for forgiving me, washing me clean. I love it that God will give many who did not persevere the opportunity to persevere again. But church, I want to say you have persevered. And what I see being worked in the men of God that I respect in our church, let me tell you one of the, the you may have heard of a man called Mr. Lester Bray. My guess is that perhaps half of you have not even heard of Mr. Bray or even met Mr. Bray. He's one of the greatest members in the history of our church. And uh, actually, give me a wave if you did know Mr. Bray. Can I just see? Uh, I tell you, he used to, he literally used to grow vegetables where you're sitting right now in this very place. He remembered when there was almost, there was one house every hundred acres. He actually ran the shop at Delta. He was one of the great engineers in the history of what became the largest airport uh, in the world, and a man who just loved our church and blessed the church. Here's the thing I notice about the church men that I really admire. They're almost devoid of personal preference. Personal preference doesn't mean anything to them. If you wanted to talk about music, Mr. Bray would say, literally, he said, you could, he'd say, you could bang a couple of, couple of rocks together for all I care, but I'm going to praise the Lord. <laughs> personal preference doesn't come into it. For a mature man of God. You know why? <coughs> Excuse me. You notice it took a lot of skill to know how to cough and move the microphone away at the same time. There you go again. And uh, anyway, so do you know why he was devoid of that personal preference? Because he had suffered. 
and persevered over many, many years. He would often talk about what it was like being at New Hope during the Great Depression. And that formed character in him. When character is formed in, in you, you don't care about all the silly stuff. You don't fret about all the small stuff. But you're focused on what your true hope is. And that is the living God. Church, I want to encourage us to persevere. And that perseverance will build character in each one of us. Can I tell you a little bit about those words? Suffering literally means here, tribulation, distress, or pressure. Pastor, I don't want tribulation. I mean, no one wants tribulation, but Jesus said in this world, you will have tribulation. And have you noticed that he was true to his word? Tribulation came and tribulation will come. In fact, there will be a great tribulation in the future as well. But in the midst of that suffering, what do we do? We persevere. That literally means to patiently endure, to persevere in a spiritual way, to persevere in a godly way. That produces character. Char character here is literally proven character. It's close to the idea of a refiner's fire, of gold and silver being purified. We sometimes sing, we sang it at the South Campus actually, the goodness of God. You've led me through the fire, but I've seen the goodness of God. This is God's growth plan, and we need to cooperate with Him in every stage for spiritual growth. In summary, we've looked at what God has done for me on the cross. What God has done for me on the cross is who I am. Everyone say, who I am. It all goes back to the cross. We were powerless. We've got access. We've been justified. We have peace. And so we restate that. Everything we know and everything we are comes because of what God has done. But I want to restate my second point and say, but it's also who I am that I must suffer and persevere and grow. And I've got a question. Do you accept God's growth plan in your life? Will you cooperate with the Holy Spirit that when you suffer, when there's tribulation, when there's distress, and it, it may be, you may be in that right now. It may be about to come. And I don't want you to be fearful of that. Don't be fearful of that. If God's given you a nice flat piece of land to live on right now and your life's going smooth and smoothly well, hallelujah, I would say. But remember, Jesus said, in this world, you'll have trouble. So, so I, my question is, in the midst of suffering, will we cooperate with God's kingdom growth plan. What do you think, everybody? Can we stand together? Sermon's still live, by the way. Sermon's still on, but I'm asking us to stand in the sermon. Okay, y'all can go to the end of the sermon. Is that okay? But I want you to stand in the midst of this sermon. I've got a story to tell you as I think about cooperating with God's plan. I've got a friend or an acquaintance, and a few people have messaged me about it because his story's been in ESPN News and Wall Street Journal and everything. But he's, he's just left Welsh rugby and signed for the Kansas City Chiefs for the next three years. We're really sad to lose him from Welsh rugby because he's a superstar. Um, I saw him in one game when he scored a try running at 24 miles an hour, which is probably quicker than anyone else in this room, even me. I know it's hard to believe. But um, anyway, we're sad to lose Louis Rees Zamet. We call him Zam. Some people call him Grease Lightning because he's so fast. But he is blessed with incredible gifts. In rugby, we say he's got wheels. He's that fast. And he's also a handsome guy. He looks a bit like Cristiano Ronaldo. In fact, I would even say he might even be more handsome than Travis Kelce. I don't know. I mean, that might be stretching it right now on that one. But um, the thing about Zam is that he's got this rare gift. But he also knows he's got to work at it. And if you play rugby, you don't just play defense or offense. You're there for 80 minutes, taking all the hits, putting in a dozen tackles, crashing into rucks, running, kicking, all that kind of stuff. So he knows how to work hard. He's well trained in that. But now he's going to have to learn it all over again. He's going to have to learn a new set of skills and play against people that have been playing since they were six years old. Uh, I don't know whether Zam will win or not, but I'm moving from a sense of loss to a sense of, wow, this is a pretty cool story that Zam uh, working right now. He could even receive a ball from Patrick Mahomes, uh, which I think is pretty good anyway. But the point I'm making is that he's been blessed with gifts. But when you've been blessed with the gift, the gift, you've also got to make sure that it gets put to use as well. Amen. So I'm going to ask church a question. Will we cooperate with God's growth plan in our life, even if it involves pain and suffering? Will we do that? I think it would be really sweet if, it, if at this point, as Eli or Cynthia come and, come and sing with us right now, I think it would be lovely if <clears throat> from the back, from the middle, from the front, we come forward and just say, God, I'm cooperating with your chain reaction from suffering, perseverance, 
believing that that will produce character. And though I want hope in the suffering right now, it's then through the perseverance and the growth of character that hope rises and people even will look to me as a person of hope, new hope. So come on, let's do this. Let's say yes, Lord. Come forward as we have the wonderful music plays. Thank you.